Good morning. It's 830 on Thursday, March 31st. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, a leading women's rights advocate in the state says a new equal pay bill rings hollow. Then why this year's pollen season is extra sniffly. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Toppled trees, down power lines, and overturned mobile home are among the damages reported in Harrison and Jackson counties as severe weather swept across Mississippi yesterday afternoon. High winds and isolated tornadoes sheared off some roofs. A tornado came through Jackson where a tree at the governor's mansion fell into the street. Media reports include unconfirmed tornadoes in Van Cleve, Wade, and Hurley. Mallory White is with the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, and she speaks with MPB's Rob Lane. If someone sustains damage to their homes, uh, the first thing that they need to do is file an insurance claim um, and go ahead and get that paperwork started. That will make life a lot easier, especially if we qualify for federal assistance, which is something we don't know at this point. Um, the next thing that they can do is go to our website, msema.org, and do a self-report. Now, this is not an application for assistance. This is for information gathering. But the faster we get this information, the faster we can assess the damage and kind of get a better understanding of just how widespread the damage is. And should people be taking photos? What kinds of photos should they be taking, if so? Absolutely. So if someone does have damage to their home, the first thing that they need to do, aside from filing an insurance claim, is go ahead and document that damage. And the type of damage that we're looking for is the integrity of the home, the walls of it, inside and outside, the roof, inside and outside as well. Uh, We want to see what exactly was damaged um, as far as the structure of the home. We don't need to see your fence or your barn, or even your garage, because the garage is not considered the primary living space. So those are just a few things to keep in mind when taking those photos. There is a line that people can contact for for assistance, is that right? So the first thing someone needs to do if they have damage to their home and they may need a tarp or something like that, they need to contact their county emergency management office. And the reason for that is because the county needs to gauge just how widespread the need is in their area. So if they need to request resources from MEMA, they can do that. Another option, if someone needs resources, can call our MEMA call center, and that's 1-800-445-6362. The hours are 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, and Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And if you're without power, what's best practice? So if you are without power, we urge people to make sure that if you have medical issues, um, to contact your emergency management agency as soon as you can, if that's possible. A couple of things to keep in mind, um, stay away from down power lines, keep your freezers and refrigerators closed. Um, If you are going to use a generator, uh, use it. It has to be outdoors, away from any windows, and just have alternate plans, though, for uh, especially we have a lot of people with diabetes in Mississippi, and so your insulin has to stay cold. Make sure that you have a way to keep that cool until the power can come back on or contact um, our call center or your EMA director to let them know of the issues that you're having. One thing that we also want to bring folks' attention to, on our website, we have a tab for frequently asked questions. It's the same questions that we typically get from residents right after a disaster. One of the big questions we get is, um, can I have a check to help rebuild my home? Well, that is not how the process works. There's a whole damage assessment process that we have to go through before we can even invite FEMA down here to look at the damage to request a declaration. So we want to level some expectations for folks that this is a marathon. This is not a sprint whenever it comes to disaster recovery. 
We do. We work with wonderful partners here at MEMA, such as the American Red Cross and the Salvation Army, Team Rubicon. And so we will use as many resources as we can to help get back to normalcy. And so we just ask people for patience during the damage assessment process. It may seem like we're taking forever or we're dragging our feet, but we're doing it um, as as quickly and as efficiently as we can. So we want to do it right the first time instead of having to go back and correct any mistakes. So we just ask for patience. And when we have kind of back-to-back severe weather events like we've had this month here in the state, does that make the process move all the more slowly? It is challenging with doing damage assessments. You know, did this happen on March 22nd or did it happen recently? One of those things, we, we try to go ahead and capture the damage that w- that occurred last week and get that in, in the system pretty quickly. Um, I think, though, one of our challenges is not even the damage assessments. It's the complacency to the message, um, if, especially if folks didn't see any action last week. We worry about people not taking the messaging seriously as we continue throughout the spring. Um, these these types of forecasts are going to pop up pretty frequently, especially going into uh, April and May. And then, and then we have hurricane season right after that. And so we just ask people to take the forecast seriously. You are going to see forecasts like this again. And um, just monitor the weather and have a plan in place on how you're going to uh, act during the event and how you're going to recover afterwards. Mallory White is with the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency. Coming up, a leading women's rights activist in the state says a new equal pay bill rings hollow. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Mississippi yesterday became the 50th and last U.S. state to pass an equal pay bill. House Bill 770, named the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act, is now headed to the governor's desk. But the bill contains exceptions that frustrate some gender equality activists. Cassandra Welchlin is director of the Black Women's Roundtable in Mississippi, and she tells MPB's Kobe Vance women in the state would have been better off had lawmakers not addressed the equal pay issue at all. It's a really devastating setback um, for women in Mississippi and especially for black women and brown women as we experience some of the largest wage gaps um, in the state. Nothing is equal about the bill that has just been passed um, this week. First of all, um, it actually gives an employer the right to pay women less for equal work and it expressly codifies into law an employer's decision to to really discriminate against her for having gaps in her um, employment, um, particularly the language continuity of employment history. And so basically what this means is that for a woman um, who has taken off work for having a baby um, or caring for a loved one or caring for a child, um, these policies um, really harm working mothers and family caregivers. I wanted to ask, what is the importance of getting an equal pay bill in Mississippi? Because Mississippi has been the only state that has not passed an equal pay bill. Well, we know there are different components that make up a a good equal pay bill. And the reason why we started um, advocating for such a bill is because um, we know that women are making less on the dollar than her male counterpart, uh, her her white male counterpart. So for instance, you know, um, black women are making 56 cents on the dollar, white women are making 75 cents on the dollar. So what that means is that we're not getting our full paycheck um, that we've earned and worked for. And so um, the other thing that that means is that Uh, we needed an equal pay bill that will help us cut the poverty rate in half and that will add um, more money to the state's economy. And so um, 
that was really important to really try to get a bill that did that and a bill that would protect employees, you know, from being retaliated against and from um, preventing them and preventing employers from relying on salary history. Um, so those kinds of things, that's why we were needing a bill. Uh, we were last, but we were advocating for a bill that would do more to protect her wages. Um, and and that that is why, you know, our advocacy work was so important um, because women, you know, again, are the breadwinners and the co-breadwinners of their families, but they're making less than their male counterparts. What language about this bill do y'all take, do y'all take concern with? First, the salary history and continuity of employment history. Those two things are very, that we're really taking issue with. Um, again, what this means is that employers are relying on salary history. We know that women aren't getting paid what they should be getting paid to begin with. And so for an employer to rely on what she made in her previous job, knowing that there is wage and um, wage discrimination based on sex and race, um, that's problematic. And that contributes to the wage gap. Um, the other thing that is very concerning to us is the, again, the language around continuity of employment. So basically, you know, what this means is that without supportive policies such as pregnancy accommodations, breastfeeding accommodations, flexible schedules, access to child care, you know, many mothers and family givers have no choice but to leave the workforce altogether in order to fulfill their caregiving responsibilities. So this results in the gaps. So because women are taking off work to have their babies to care give. And this is at no fault of her own. And so for them to put this language in the bill that gives an employer the right to discriminate, it's uh, explicitly discriminating against a woman for being a woman. And we know that during this pandemic, women have left the workforce in millions um, because um, of the lack of support for caregiving responsibilities. So that's one of the things that we're really concerned about um, in this bill. I think the other thing, too, is that a woman has to choose. Um, she has to decide if she's going to um, choose if she's going to file under the state law or the federal law. And other states allow you to file under both. And so what this does, it says, is that you have to waive your rights. If you file, um, you have to wa waive your federal rights to file under the state law. And that is, to me, unconstitutional. But they also put language in that bill that says if anything in here is unconstitutional, everything else would stay, which says, again, that they knew that there are some things in this bill that could probably be unconstitutional. And so we would prefer to have had no bill come back to the table to get a good, clean bill that did the things that we know that women need to protect their wages than to have a bill that further discriminates and further punishes a woman for being a woman. If this bill is signed by the governor and not vetoed, it would go into effect on July 1st. Responding to what you just said, um, what would be your advice to someone who feels they need to, you know, to go to court about their wage gap? Do you feel it would be better that for them to pursue the federal courts or the state courts under this new law? For us, we would definitely, and we, we're, we're going to start our campaign on this, is to tell people not to use this law. Um, it would be more harmful to use this law than to use the federal law. And the federal law, um, people say, well, well, at least it's, um, it's weaker than the federal law. No, actually, the federal law is better than this law. This is not weaker. This is more discriminatory. And so we will tell people um, to file under that federal law, again, which doesn't provide all of the remedies that you need, but it certainly uh, would not do harm like this bill would do. And so Mississippi definitely could have done better. Um, we will continue to work to try to um, um, make this bill uh, better, but it's very hard to go back to make a bill better. Uh, we know that. Um, it's taken us seven years to get here, and um, it will probably take a very long time to make this bill um, better than what it is. Um, but Mississippi definitely could have done better, and it just says 
um, it, it speaks to how lawmakers really feel about women's labor in the state of Mississippi um, and their and their and their worth um, to punish a woman for having a baby, caregiving, and for relying on her salary is is very problematic. Cassandra Welchlin is director of the Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable. Still ahead, feel like this year's allergy season is worse than usual? It's not your imagination. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Spring is in the air. That's terrible news for allergy sufferers like me. Dr. Joshua Phillips is an allergist at Mississippi Asthma and Allergy Clinic. He tells Rob Lane that this March, Mississippians are breathing in even more pollen than in years past. We are having warmer weather every year. And uh, if you remember in December, we were having um, uh, an unseasonally warmed uh, December, and uh, we, we were seeing uh, buds on the trees, you know, already. And then it was unusual in January. We had some very uh, intensely cold um, days, and so the, the 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 trees are, you know, maybe confused as to what season that they're in, but they're definitely pollinating earlier and earlier each year, and pollen seasons are lasting longer and longer as well. Allergy sufferers exist on sort of a spectrum. What makes someone's allergies bad enough that they might have to, for example, come in and see you? Well, if you're suffering with miserable nasal allergy symptoms, and this time of the year we see um, many patients who are having uh, conjunctivitis, so itchy and watery eyes, they're having runny nose, they're having sneezing. Um, we're, we're used to seeing pollen allergies, but many patients also have indoor allergies as well. And you have to think of it as, you know, the, the things that you're allergic to fills up a cup. And so if you have allergies to dust mites and indoor uh, furred animals like your dogs and cats, you know, half of your cup may be already filled up with the things that you're exposed to every day. And then when the pollen counts uh, rise and we hit our, our spring pollen season, now the cup is running over and you're spilling, spilling over with, um, with uh, abundant nasal allergy symptoms. Now, I'm curious, we know that some allergies like a lot of food allergies, peanut allergies, for example, are becoming genetically more common in Americans. Is that true for these kind of seasonal sort of respiratory allergies as well? It absolutely is. Unfortunately, because of climate change, you know, we're seeing uh, longer and longer pollen seasons. And so the, the pollen seasons are, are currently, you know, up to 20 days longer than they used to be. And that's in studies that were uh, looked at over a 30-year period. And we're seeing about a 20% increase in, in pollen counts each year as well. And so the season is lasting longer and it is uh, more intense. And a number of factors are related to that. You know, uh, the, the biggest factor is increased um, uh, uh, annual temperatures. Um, they've also looked at increased CO2 levels, and that does uh, make a difference, although it's less intense um, uh, compared to the increased warming trend. But all of this results in higher pollen counts, and, and if you're genetically predisposed, it's actually the higher pollen counts that, that, that trigger the development of allergies. And so as we see higher pollen counts, we see more and more allergy sufferers who previously uh, in decades past were not having symptoms, and now they're coming in with, uh, with more intense allergy symptoms, and they're getting more intense every year. And, and so there's absolutely a trend toward more allergen sensitization and more allergy sufferers being affected. Uh, and again, we think that is uh, climate change uh, derived. In the short term, allergy symptoms are annoying. Is there a long term, any sort of long term consequences to, to these kinds of allergies? Or is it really just that in the moment, itchy eyes, Oh, no, no, it can have dire consequences for those sufferers. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, during when high pollen counts, um, when we are seeing high pollen counts, you know, it frequently drives things like uh, ER visits, uh, especially with our asthma sufferers. You know, it can be a life and death situation if you're an asthmatic and, and exposed to high pollen. 
uh, as well as um, increased you know, doctor visits, sinus infections, um, sometimes pneumonias and, and, and other consequences to your health. Uh, sometimes allergy uh, or pollen levels can trigger skin reactions like severe eczema or hives. And so this is definitely more than, than just a runny nose for many of our allergy sufferers. It's a, a driving force behind their, uh, an inflammatory cascade inside their body. And so how can people think about dealing with allergies, both perhaps if they have more mild allergies, any home remedies or best practices, and potentially for someone with more severe allergies, how best to, to handle those to make sure that you don't expose yourself to any of those dire consequences? So the most important, you know, initial thing that we discuss is, is just, you know, avoiding your trigger. And so identifying your trigger and avoiding it is going to be your, your best first step. If you, if you must do work outside and, and, and you want to enjoy those activities, you know, where, where, uh, where you're outdoors during high pollen counts, you know, we recommend wearing a face mask if available in N95 when doing yard work or stirring up pollen outside. We recommend showering after coming inside, including washing your hair and changing your clothes. Uh, to just wash the, you know, physically wash the pollen off of your body. Uh, we recommend uh, taking allergy medications like antihistamines about 30 minutes before doing outdoor work. And we recommend, you know, for cars and for, um, um, for home windows, keeping those windows closed to not allow uh, mixing of outdoor air uh, into the indoor environment. Um, next level would be medications, and so there are a number of good over-the-counter medications that are available now. So you have intranasal uh, corticosteroids. Uh, that would be the, the most important class for your nasal allergy symptoms. And then just recently in the last year or so, we had uh, ocular antihistamine medicines. So these are, are eye drops that shut down allergy symptoms for a 24-hour period. Those are pretty readily available and very effective for patients with eye allergy symptoms. And then the old standby, you know, your, your, your uh, H1 uh, antihistamines. Um, so those are, have been around for the longest, and those give kind of the most immediate and quickest relief. So just as it looks like maybe we're getting COVID-19 under control here in Mississippi, it might be time to put the, the N95 back on to help deal with pollen. It is. It's really true. The N95 has always been a part of the allergy world and an, an important part of it to decrease uh, uh, pollen exposure. It filters out uh, pollen, you know, um, uh, very effectively. Of course, other masks are also effective, but the N95 is really where it's at if you're severely pollen allergic. I'm wearing mine. Dr. Joshua Phillips is an allergist at Mississippi Asthma and Allergy Clinic. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Creature Comforts. Then at 10, it's Autocorrect. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. See you tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi Edition.